AMI Revolution is always a very special place for me, uh, at least once a year, uh, if not twice, sometimes three, but I count on AMI Revolution coming to Philadelphia, and this actually brings back a lot of great memories for me. Uh, stepping on the campus, as Pastor Young talked about his fervent heart and Pastor Charlie for U of I, I came in in the fall of 92 at UPenn, and I remember just getting saved there and just growing like crazy spiritually, likewise prayer walking, and it's just exciting. Every time I see GCC, uh, it's a reminder that God honors all prayer. I mean, we were probably like about 50, our college group, and so I just threw church being birthed here and different things. Uh, you know, I, I feel like through prayer, we've seen hundreds of people come to know the Lord, and it's exciting to see all the Christian ministries. And it's also a reminder of my first love. You know, Jacob had his Bethel experience going back a second time, and he was reminded of the first time he fell in love with God. And boy, even when we worship, uh, really sincerely, I, I was really blessed. And we need to hear each other's voices. And we need to hear and sense one another's prayers because when two or more come in agreement, there's power. Amen? And so I want to thank you because I'm here sharing the word tonight. Uh, but after, beyond that, I'm also here just for myself. And it's been a very long year. I've learned a lot about the sovereignty of God. And I feel like God has given me focus and vision for the future. But it was a very difficult 12 months. And every time I come back, I'm reminded he is faithful. Through the ups and downs, mountains high, valley low, he is the rock upon which we can stand. And so it is, before I go on, it is my privilege, sincerely. Uh, I don't take the pulpit lightly. It's my sincere privilege to be able to share the word of God. Uh, I was talking with Pastor Barry, and he seemed a little happy. And uh, why are you happy, Barry? And he's like, I'm happy I'm not going after Pastor Charlie. <laughs> 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 Something like that. Uh, title of the sermon is called God's Holiness, a Burnt Offering, and Our Mission. Before we read the text, uh, let me just bow in a word of prayer. And uh, God has already given revelation that he's going to move tonight. Father, we stand here and we are on holy ground. And on one hand, there is a reverence and a fear and an awe for you. But it is perfectly balanced with a sensitivity and a joy and a delight in the sincerity and the love of God who adopts us as his children. And we come here tonight wanting our hearts renewed, and we turn to the very source of revelation, inspired scripture. You need not change. You are perfect as you are and as the word stands. And tonight, God, we pray that you would take this somewhat obscure text and you would galvanize our hearts. And from here would be a movement and a generation of worshipers that will do great things for the kingdom as we see you ascended on high. And so, Lord, I pray that I would be able to do, do justice to your word, uh, but more than uh, the human preacher, we pray for the divine spirit to touch our hearts and to do what you intend to do. Meet no resistance here, and God, just release us into a love fest of prayer and worship tonight. Set the captives free. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Christianity is tough because we tend to live in an era where we magnify or idolize what is good and we tend to trivialize or minimize what is great. Two weeks ago, arguably, we probably saw the greatest NBA finals at least in the past 25 years. I am old enough and going all the way back to Larry Bird against Magic Johnson, kid you not, I think this is one of the best NBA finals since the early 80s. If you watched Game 6, it was phenomenal. I was at a sports grill bar watching with a bunch of church people and a bunch of strangers, and the Heat found themselves on the verge of elimination, down 15 points in the fourth quarter, and then all of a sudden an animal appeared on the court, LeBron James. <laughs> this man went into beast mode, did he not? He had that eye of the tiger, he had the claws, the fangs, and he basically said, get on my shoulders, I'm taking us home. And the 15-point lead dwindled, 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 and with 25 seconds left, I myself thought, done, Spurs in the championship. 
In fact, I I turned away for a a brief second to come back, and LeBron had sunk a three-pointer, cutting it to two. Well, Leonard went to the line, choked, only made one, and I came back just in time to see someone miss a three-pointer on the heat, and the rebound was tapped out, and all in one motion, Ray Allen, silky as smooth, right? He he takes the catch, turns around, fades, hits a three-pointer, swish. And at that moment, thank you. (laughs) And at that moment, I'm not kidding, all of us, two-thirds of us were Heat fans. We jump up and we're high-fiving, right? I'm like hugging my church members. I turn around, there's a six-foot-five, 230-pound stranger. I don't know who he is, but we're hugging. (laughs) And we're high-fiving. And then everybody in the planet seemed to watch Game 7. Sorry, I don't mean to sound sexist, but... There were these sisters in our church who had no clue how many points a, a free throw was, you know, and they, they came out to watch the game, and it was so exciting, and whew, it was one of the best series ever. And if you have Facebook, I guarantee you that night, everyone was posting about the Heat Spurs game. Think about it. We magnify the good, and we trivialize and minimize the great Jonathan Edwards wrote this, Our external delights, our earthly pleasures, our ambition, and our reputation, our human relationships for all of these things, our desires are eager, our appetites are strong, our love warm and affectionate. When it comes to these things, our hearts are tender and sensitive, deeply impressed, easily moved, much concerned, and greatly engaged. We're depressed at our losses. We're excited and joyful when any worldly success or prosperity come to us. But when it comes to spiritual matters, how dull we tend to feel. How heavy and how hard our hearts are. We can sit and hear the infinite length and height and breadth and love of God in Christ Jesus, of His giving of His infinitely dear Son, and yet sit there cold and unmoved. If we're going to be excited about anything, shouldn't it be our spiritual lives? Edwards asks, is there anything more inspiring, more exciting, more lovable and desirable in heaven or on earth than the gospel of Jesus Christ? We should be utterly humbled that we are not more emotionally affected than we are in the church. Community of AMI, my heart is that tonight we would be awakened to the affections of God by responding most appropriately to the accuracy of who He is. We're turning a hinge. Last night we heard about how God is our refuge and ever-present help in time of trouble and how He is that anchor and He's faithful through the generations of David and Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and how He is the Lord of hosts and at any given moment He can command thousands of angels to beckon and to fight on our aid. And this morning we talked about the advance of the gospel in the light of adversity, which produces incredible infinite joy. As we hit the halfway turning point of this conference, I want to try to put everything together to awaken our affections. What is the basis upon, I believe this is somewhat of a mission conference. We're not only sending out to short-term teams or one-year people, but for one year until AMI revolution happens again, All of us are being sent out into the harvest, declaring that we have a kingdom vision, and it has to be more than something that is just trivial. We get caught up in programs. We get caught up in even just worship songs, meaning the externals. Meanwhile, the church of Jesus Christ does not get as excited about the gospel and who Jesus is. And we want to look at him, and we want to go to a very exciting text called the book of Leviticus. I am really excited. I believe that 95% of you have never heard a sermon from Leviticus in the past five years. How many of you have heard a sermon in the past five years? Okay. I bet you that's Pastor Victor's church. Yeah, that man's crazy enough to preach through Leviticus. (laughs) I heard him preach through Leviticus three times, and uh, it is such a rich passage. It is so deep in theology and so deep in practical application, and my hope is that the beauty of Scripture, every passage is just as exciting as the other, would come to surface tonight. 
I know it can sound pretty boring, right? When you do your annual Bible reading pledge in January, you fly through Genesis and the narratives of the patriarchs, and then you get to the exciting stuff of the slavery and the Red Sea and and everything, and then you come to Leviticus and you're like, can I skip this? (laughs) Doesn't even the name Leviticus sound boring? When when I say Romans, you think, whoa, rich. When I say John, all I am statements and Jesus and all that red letters in the button, the gospel, yeah. When I say psalm, you're like, ooh, poetry. Right? When I say Song of Solomon, oh, sex. <laughs> but when I say Leviticus, you're like, huh? <laughs> Was that written by the apostle, disciple Levi? No. <laughs> right? Sounds like the jeans that I wear. There's nothing exciting about Leviticus, right? Did you know that Jesus quoted Leviticus frequently? In fact, one of his favorite passages came from Leviticus 19, verse 18, and it's the second greatest commandment. In Leviticus, it says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Here in Philadelphia, you're reminded every time you go down into Center City, and if you go check out Liberty Bell, if you ever read the inscription and the verse at the top of the Liberty Bell, where it says, and proclaim liberty and freedom all throughout the land, That same verse that served as a battle cry in the American Revolution, as well as the 1800s, where slavery and emancipation was a a huge issue, and they declared the verse, it came from Leviticus, proclaim throughout the land that there's liberty. So tonight, let's go to Leviticus, and I want to just highlight a few things before we start. There's three major themes. There's priests. There's people, and there's sacrifices, and each of those point to Jesus. If you want to read your Old Testament well and properly, basically everything ought to be pointing to Christ. We don't just read it on its own. And through that, there's many mentions of priests, right? Levite, who are the Levites, right? They were the tribe. They were the priestly tribe, right? We think of Aaron and him getting ordained, came out of the tribe of Levi. And in the priests, we see ultimately that Jesus is our perfect great high priest. When the people are introduced in Leviticus, like we'll see in Leviticus 1, we're reminded that they fell short of the command that God said, be ye holy as I am holy, and they were not holy. But everything in the book of Leviticus points to Christ in that he is the holy one who will be the sacrifice of all sacrifice, which leads to the third I'm just painting the backdrop. Right? I'm going to spend a half the sermon just describing and teaching, and the last half will be some observations and some application. Here's the outline of Leviticus that, as I read, uh, in the first seven chapters, there's five different sacrifices. And then chapters 8 to 10, we see that it's about the consecration and the function of the priests, even ordination. And then chapters 11 through 15 are these regulations. Uh, Chapter 16 is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And then the last 11 chapters going to 27 have to do with laws of holiness. Well, well, I'm sure, why is this so boring, right? Well, let's get to the text. Verse 1. The Lord called Moses and spoke to him from the tent of meeting, saying, Speak to the people of Israel and say to them, When, if you have NIV, or one of the translations, King James may say, if, when or if any one of you brings an offering to the Lord, you shall bring your offering of livestock from the herd or from the flock. Uh, Let's go back to the context. Genesis, Exodus, after Passover, going through the Red Sea and the Red Sea crashing down upon the Egyptian army. And then we see Moses going up on Mount Sinai, and I preached on it last year in Exodus 33, the glory of God and how power comes from presence. And his face shone, and he was given the stone tablets and the Ten Commandments. And and then we know toward the end of Exodus, there's instructions for this tabernacle to be built. And then the last chapter, chapter 40 of Exodus, most translations will subtitle it something like, the glory of God fills the temple. So it's getting exciting. 
Everything has been erected or the tabernacle and, and, and the glory of God, the Shekinah glory, it comes. And from there, every time the Israelites move out, there is smoke over them during the day and fire over them at night. And so everything had to be very portable. And in the midst of Exodus 40 and the glory of the Lord being manifest, Exodus and Leviticus are like a tight glove. They're married to one another. It's meant to be seen in conjunction. So as the glory of the Lord fills the tabernacle, immediately we go into Leviticus and he talks about these burnt offerings. Three sets of instructions as we read the remainder of the chapter. You're going to see that there's three different orders. First, verse 3. If his offering is a burnt offering from the herd, meaning cows or bulls, he shall be a male without blemish. He shall bring it to the entrance of the tent. This is the worshiper, you and I. And he may be accepted before the Lord. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Then he shall kill the bull before the Lord, and Aaron's sons, the priests, shall bring the blood and throw the blood against the sides of the altar that is at the tent entrance of the tent of meeting. Then he shall flay, right, skin, the animal, the burnt offering, and cut it into pieces. And the sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire on the altar and arrange wood on the fire. And Aaron's sons, the priests, shall arrange the pieces, the head, the fat, on the wood that is on the fire on the altar. But its entrails and its legs he shall wash with water. And the priest shall burn all of it on the altar as a burnt offering. That's the first offering. A food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. Uh, there's five types of offering. Every chapter, first five of Leviticus, will talk about them. First, in this chapter, it's the burnt offering. Chapter two, grain, then the peace, then the sin, and then the guilt. I think in order to visualize it, if you can see that, the, the tabernacle would be that covered big structure in the back. And, and in there would be where, you know, the, the more like holy place and, and the idea of just the, t the tent of meeting. But on the outside, you see the courtyard. The courtyard was probably about half a football field. And so it was pretty impressive. Uh, at the smack dab middle, you see a small little basin. And in front of that, there's the altar. And so imagine that. If someone had a bull or a cow, they would bring their best, a male without defect or blemish, and that they would lay it on the altar. It would get flayed, it would get skinned, it would get chopped up. And then the priest would take it to the basin, and they would take the dirtier parts, like the, I don't know, legs, butt, I don't know what gets dirty, but everything needed to be clean. And so they, they would take it there, even washing their hands, and come back, sprinkle the blood on the altar, and then they would light the fire, and this fire was meant to be kept burning day and night. That's the first type of offering. The second offering would be, if you don't have a cow or a bull, it's similar language. If his gift for a burnt offering is from the flock, so instead of a herd, bulls and cows, it's, okay, if you don't have that, then bring a sheep or a goat, and the rest is similar, without defect and a male, and he shall kill it on the north side of the altar. Aaron's sons, the priest, shall throw its blood against the sides of the altar. He shall cut it into pieces, flay the thing, head, fat, priests arranging them on the wood, but the entrails and the legs, verse 13, he shall wash with water, similar, and the priest shall offer all of it and burn it on the altar. It is a burnt offering, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. If, and this is the third one, if you don't even have a sheep or a goat, then at least bring a bird. Then he shall bring his offering of turtle doves or pigeons. Basically, God is saying anyone can come to worship because the low animal on the totem pole are these birds, pigeons, right? Oh, are there still pigeons in West Philly? I hated those things, right? Those dirty, ugly, nasty, vulture-esque pigeons, <laughs> They were so fat because they, they ate so much. And I don't know if they're still here, but when I walked at UPenn, we wanted to kill these pigeons. But the idea is even if you have a pigeon, you can offer that up. No mention of male, 
no mention of unblemished because they're basically making it so easy that every and anyone can come and offer a burnt offering and worship God in this way. Why and when would you make these offerings to the Lord? Track with me a little bit more. On some occasions, a burnt offering would be made out of a pledge of devotion to the Lord, but primarily in the book of Leviticus, three main occasions by which there was a burnt offering. The first one was a daily morning and evening offering simply given out of conviction. And so it says in Numbers 28 that they were regular burnt offerings, regular daily sacrifices. you got to envision this. In chapter 6 of Leviticus, in verse 9, it says, Command Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. Sorry if you can't read the next part. The burnt offering shall be on the hearth, on the altar, all night until the morning. And the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. Verse 12, The fire on the altar shall be kept burning on it. This is significant. It shall not go out. The priest shall burn wood on it every morning, and he shall arrange the burnt offering on it, and shall burn it on the fat of the peace offerings. Verse 13, fire shall be kept burning on the altar continually. It should not go out. So if you picture the tabernacle and then the basin and the altar, maybe you're thinking, it's not that big a deal. Okay, daily offerings all throughout the day, not a big deal. A lot of people coming in and out, offering these burnt offerings. But even at night, 24-7, The command to the Levites in chapter 6 is, priests, you got to make sure that the fire never gets put out. That's significant. We'll come back to it. So there were daily offerings, and this was only one of five. And then the second occasion would have been special days. If you read Leviticus, there's many feasts, festivals, maybe on a Sabbath or sometimes the first month day of every was considered a a special day, and and just voluntarily people would come and and give burnt offerings on top of day and night all throughout. And and lastly, when someone became ceremonially unclean, and this didn't even have to do with sin. That's why Leviticus gets hard and almost boring, right? There's rules about what if uh, you touch mildew? (laughs) What if you're walking down the the, the road and a camel hits another guy and he dies? And it's not relevant, but you become ceremonially unclean. Not that you have intentionally sinned, but for all three of these occasions, and this is only one of the offerings and sacrifices, the idea being that This tabernacle worship would continue, not only at a corporate dimension, that at Yom Kippur and just the yearly act of, you know, just atonement and shedding the blood of an animal, that was a corporate function. These are individual functions. And not only for the involuntary, but for the voluntary, the idea being 24-7, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, for thousands of years. Think about the activity that came through the tabernacle and the style of worship. Okay, what does all this mean? Four things and one application. First, what is our response? In this passage, I think two things we can learn. One, in light of the sophistication of the Old Testament sacrificial system, number one, we see that our worship was always meant to be costly. The animal needed to be male because in Hebrew law, the males were more valuable. And he started by saying, okay, bring the most valuable thing that you have. If anyone has a herd, if you have a bull, if you have an ox, you got to bring it. But then when we go down the pecking order and we get to those dirty, right, pigeons, you think, well, they're not costly. Well, that was the most costly that they had. I think there's a tendency before we move on and look at the holiness of God and this burnt sacrifice, I think there's a tendency for us to be so comfortable and casual in our Christianity that year after year, we too can do religious things like burnt offerings. And before you know it, the question is, are you giving God your best? 
Or truth be told, are we just giving him the scraps of what is left over? I got my MCATs. Don't want to serve. Can't do the family group thing because I look at my course load. I'm a young adult now. I guess if young adult life makes you, right, that much uh, more busy. <laughs> you know, just uh, I'll come when I can. And God's attitude here from the very beginning, our response is, do you give your best to God? Uh, about 10 years ago, I, I was on a trip to New York. And I think this was before Pastor Bruce and uh, I guess maybe Pastor Vic was around, but my friend took me to Redeemer Church. I'm sorry. Right? Right? If there was an AMI church, I'm sorry, but my friend took me to Redeemer. And you know, during that time, i just come out of seminary, and, and, and I, I knew what it meant to worship God. Sat in the pews, and when offering time came around, I'm on vacation, right? We're about to go to a Broadway musical. So I whip out my wallet, and I got two bills. Right? I got a $100 bill. And I got a $5 bill. And that's all I had. And I'm in New York, right? Where everything costs $100. And I'm struggling. And I'm like, oh, you know, I got this, I got that. You know, what am I going to do? And, and at that moment, God just convicted me, give the $100. And I was, ouch. I, I'm just seminary right out. And, you know, $100, that's like $10,000. And I would have been justified thousand people in Redeemer Church, ten dollars, it's pretty significant, right? It's like how much I make a day at JCA, right? And, and yeah, I'm thinking, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, God was saying, Matt, not only you went to seminary, your pastor, but as a Christian, learn to give God your best. Now, that doesn't always mean whip out your wallets this Sunday and give the highest bill. If the Spirit convicts you, right? But the attitude, isn't it true that day after day, month after month, year after year, we can do the Israelite thing? And before you know it, your heart is waning. Do you give God the scraps of your time and energy and money that's left over? Try to cut corners. The Italian prophet, Malachi, right? Malachi, he said in chapter 1, he said, <laughs> wake up! <laughs> The Lord comes and says, how dare you rob me? What are you talking about? You know how to give to governors. You know how to give to Obama. You know how to give your best, but you do not even give your best to the Lord God. And just an honest, sincere question. As we evaluate since the last revolution or whatever your inventory looks like, are you willingly giving your best before the Lord? And that's the second thing. The burnt offering was not involuntary or mandatory. It was not corporate. It was personal. That's why it says in verse 2, uh, it should say, if or when. It's not imperative, but the idea, if someone comes to give this voluntary. You know, God never says, I'm forcing you to do anything. But he wants it out of a willful heart. Someone who says, thank you, God, for all that you provided, and it is my joy to be able to give back to you. I was talking to somebody who's a chem major at Penn. I felt sorry for her. I started off as a chem major, quickly went to bio, far easier. But as I went on in senior year, uh, there was one roommate of mine that was not a Christian. I had gone through small group with him for three years, we were best friends along with these two other guys. None of them were saved. And this one particular guy found a girlfriend. Basically, that meant, see you later, guys. <laughs> Didn't see him very much. And in my gesture and in my conviction to share the gospel with him, I said, I will take physical chemistry with you. PCAM was the hardest class I've ever taken in my life. I went through the entire semester not learning one single thing. The mean scores on our PCAM exams were often in the low 30s. I thought I was failing because I was getting 20s. And halfway through the semester, my senior year, I'm freaking out. I'm thinking, why did I take this class? Should I just get a withdrawal, that dreaded W, right? You never want to withdraw. Sorry if you have, but you never want to withdraw. 
And I was thinking, I cannot fail and jeopardize med school. And as I was praying, I was just convicted. I didn't need to take it. I could have dropped it. It was an elective. I was a bio major. But something at that moment said, you know what, even if you get a bad grade, and yeah, I got my worst grade in college, right? And then many more were that bad. <laughs> but my first C, and I was like, oh! oh but you know, as I thought about it, it was a willful decision. Because why? Because my heart for my friend and trying to reach out to him trumped more than any kind of grade that I could have got. You know, do you calculate or do you come before God voluntarily saying, Lord, it is my great joy. I give you my life. Remember what Pastor Charlie was saying? I loved it, right? He said, you don't just ask Jesus to be the king over your sin. You ask him to be the king over your life. And at this moment, is your worship costly? And secondly, is it voluntary? Let's get to the second point. I think it more, this passage points us to God's incomprehensible holiness. In Leviticus, the word holy appears 87 times. Clearly, it's the dominant theme. Be ye holy because I am holy, it appears in Leviticus. That's why you need mediators. That's why you need sacrifices. You need holy priests who use holy water, who use holy robes and holy garments and holy this and holy that. Everything needs to be holy because we are a royal holy priesthood and a nation that belongs to God. When we think about God's holiness, it is incomprehensible. It reminds us to that chapter in Isaiah 6 where these angel and seraph, did you know that right now in this room, there are scores and myriads, I believe, of angelic beings. Whether they have wings or not, definitely in heaven, we know that in Scripture. But in this room right now, we're surrounded, I believe, by thousands of angelic beings worshiping God. As they see the holiness of God in Isaiah chapter 6, what is their worship song of choice? I don't think it was a written song. I think they're just saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And they just keep repeating themselves because when they try to think about how to describe and worship God, that's the only thing that comes to mind. The chasm between God and man is infinite. And it's meant to be seen in the Old Testament sacrificial system. How you have to come again and again and again, and you got to go through priests, and you got to do this, and you got to bring these animals at this time, and all these rules and regulations pointing to the fact that he is incomprehensibly, undeniably, a holy God. And that's revealed in the burnt offering. Isaiah says in chapter 40, this is the here to just do a religious thing. You know, as Pastor Charlie was talking about the advance of the gospel and risking your life and, and it has been the supreme joy, it has to come down to who do you see your God to be? And God says, to whom? Right? To whom will you compare me that I should be him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Right now, my guess, I'm not a physicist or engineer, my guess is these light bulbs <laughs> that are above your head, each one is probably a good 50 watts. That's decent. Maybe at home you got the 25 watt, 75 if you really look long and hard, you might be able to find a 200-watt light bulb. But the idea here is that when you take the 200-watt the, the light, watt light bulb and all of a sudden you compare it to the sun, it's negligible. Infinity stacked against the number one, for all intents and purposes, the number one is zero. It does not exist. 
The God that thousands of angelic beings right now are circling around declaring the praises unto him, and as we consider what our response will be, starts and ends with, he is far greater. He's never had an imperfect thought, he's never had an imperfect motive, and he's not done anything wicked or evil because it contradicts his very nature, and this is the God who loves us. He is incomprehensibly holy, but yet, how do we live in the presence of such a God? The Old Testament burnt offerings and the sacrificial system points to the need for reconciliation. Day after day, night after night, thousands of years on end, over and over again, you got to kill these things, and we got to hope that God is appeased. Why? Because his incomprehensible holiness stands polar opposite to the fact that we are not holy. If we had this kind of worldview, if we had this kind of evangelism strategy, I believe it would change the face of Christendom. We want to get away from the idea of perfection, don't we? And, and we're flawed. And you know, just let me say, because it really convicted me. On more than one occasion in every sermon, Pastor Charlie Dates referred to the tragic decision made this week by the Supreme Court, and I could tell that many of you, you disagree. And on no scriptural, biblical basis or authority. Why? Because, you know, separation, church, and state, we don't want to offend people, but clearly it's in the Bible. And I'm thankful I'm not going to shy away either. But it's a holiness issue, and if you think that God approves of same-gender marriage, show me in the Bible holy, loving God, where he affirms that. Some of you are just biblically ignorant. Oh, Pastor Young said I look scared. Some of you. <laughs> you are taught more by the patterns of the world and culture than what this incomprehensible holy God to whom all have fallen short And we stand in need of a Savior. We stand in need of reconciliation. There was never a day in the Old Testament sacrificial system where there was not a need to confess. There was not a need to slaughter. There was not a need to go through mediators and priests and whatnot. Thirdly, what's the animal's role? Poor animal, except the pigeon. The animal plays a vicarious role. Two things just stirred my heart to the point. Literally, I was weeping this week as I thought about this text. Here's one, and it'll make sense at the very end of the sermon. Verse 4, I'm sorry you can't read it. He shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement. Two things happen when you touch the head of the animal. Number one, there's transfer. My sin and my issues and my mildew and my menstrual cycle and everything that makes me ceremonially unclean or voluntarily I want to give as an act of worship and consecration to God. I put it on you, God. Secondly, this animal takes my place. Atonement, at meant. Right? It's pretty cool. At one moment, atonement. At that moment, when the hand was laid on the head, it was accepted. Right? Important thought. Right? Now, please use your imagination okay, to feel the impact and the gravity of what God wants to do in releasing us into an amazing holy love tonight. I believe not only repentance. But God was saying threefold, come to me, I'm a holy God, bring your sin, I'm willing. God is such a willing God. Luke chapter 11, Luke chapter 18, God is such a willing God. Come before him tonight with your sin. Secondly, I believe the holiness and the love of God is the catalyst to bringing us into inner healing. And some of you have so many wounds and baggages and emotional scars and, oh, my family doesn't love me, or, oh, I've been depressed, oh, I lost my virginity, and you have all of these different things. And I really felt like God was saying tonight, call on me and I will set you free. 
And thirdly, as we think about kingdom vision, our mission is based upon this vicarious animal's rule. Day after day, this is the second thought that blew me away besides verse 4. Thousands of years, all of this activity, corporate, personal, involuntary, voluntary, through the priests, some of which you could do on your own, this day, that day, special days, regular days, thousands and thousands of years, and then finally comes this weird-looking man in camel skin clothing who eats locusts and bugs, and he says what? He says, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. I just want to pray for two hours right now. Did you get that? Right? Thousands and thousands of years, day and night, 24-7. Something that fell short and burnt offerings, and guilt offerings, sin offerings, Yom Kippur offerings, and, and, and peace offerings, and, and different things. And then finally, the forerunner comes to the scene and says, no more. Behold the Lamb of God, the sacrifice through whom, once and for all, Hebrews chapter 11, He will make atonement for our sin and never again do we need to live in this kind of fear. The last thing is Jesus fulfills. He's our burnt offering. He is the mediator. He is our priest. He's the one who fulfills when God will be with you. When we bring our best and costly and voluntary sacrifice, on what basis? Because we touch the head in faith. Finally, we're liberated, and on the cross, he became the propitiation of our sin. He became sin who knew no sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. He took on the wrath of God to satisfy the wrath that we deserved, right? Substitution, transfer. And out of this, right, it's so clear even in the New Testament, 1 Peter 1, verse 18, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways Inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as ransomed or silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb, without blemish or spot. The New Testament cannot be any more clear in validating the Old Testament. And therefore, in light of that, Ephesians 5 says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave him a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. You get that? Fragrant offering, aroma, pleasing to God, burnt offering, day after day, month after month, century after century. He was the fragrant offering. Therefore, be imitators. Therefore, we have a mission. We sin all the time. I sin. I'm going to sin tonight. I'm probably sinning right now. <laughs> You're going to sin. We're all going to sin. But Christ is our substitute. And whereas thousands and millions of herd and flock and birds had to be slaughtered, behold, incomprehensible holy God sending his male and unblemished sacrifice, his son Jesus, and saying, now you are loved. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds were healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. True or false? Ten times in that passage, it basically says there's a transfer, but true or false? God hates sinners. 
Absolutely, he hates sinners. Well, I don't know. God is love, right? 100%. God both hates and loves sinners at the same time. Psalm chapter 5, verse 5. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes, Lord. You hate sinners. That's a strong word. All right, let's do the unthinkable. Let's blot out the word hate in verse 5. Let's read the next verse. Psalm 5, verse 6. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord, oh, forget hate. That's strong. It says, God abhors sinners. Yet we know in John 3, 16 that God loves sinners. How in the world can these things happen? That is the question that the Bible answers from cover to cover, beginning to the end. And the answer is, it's found in the offering and sacrifice of Jesus at Calvary. When you grasp the idea that God both hates sinners and loves sinners at the same time, it melts our hearts and it leads us to this appropriate response. God remembers not our sins anymore. He forgets them. He blots them out. As far as the east is from the west, so too have our transgressions been removed. Now, lastly, let's go back to Isaiah 6. God is infinitely holy. Isaiah thinks he's doomed. Keep that thought. Well, the Englishman went and bought a Rolls Royce. Apparently, Rolls Royce is marketed as that car that will never break down. Well, he drove his Rolls Royce in France, and sure enough, the the Rolls Royce broke down. So he calls the company and explains the situation. Immediately, the Rolls Royce flies somebody from England to France, fixes the car, and flies the mechanic back to England. Well, a few weeks later, the man's thinking, oh, shoot, man, I got to pay for that. He lets some more time go by, and his guilt has just eaten him alive. And finally, he calls Rolls-Royce after a few months, and, and he explains the situation and never got the bill. The customer service representative looks through the records and replies over the phone, I'm sorry, sir. We have no record of your repair service. That's God. In the midst of our fallenness and in the midst of him being incomprehensibly holy, through the atonement, through the fulfillment of Jesus, now God says, it's forgotten. He keeps no record of wrong. Let's connect that as we close. Lastly, AMI. We have an urgent mission. Yes, our lives ought to be costly. It ought to be voluntary. We talked about the holiness of God. This is the gospel. He is holy. We need reconciliation. Vicariously, not through an animal, but through the Lamb of God who was slain. He became the fulfillment of the Old Testament. And now we need not any more shedding of blood for the remission of our sin. And the only thing left to do is as Pastor Charlie said, is to put the gospel as your priority. Nothing else. It falls short. We tend to magnify the trivial. And I don't mean to say they're not good, but I'm sorry, to me, you know, your hair day or what kind of grade you get in grad school, you know, it's trivial 50-watt light bulb in comparison to the sun. Your life was meant to be lived for the propagation of the gospel. And whether we experience any kind of persecution like Paul or whether we don't, when we have a high view of God and a humble view of Christ and the gospel, it ought to lead to a radical, urgent mission. Let's go back to Isaiah as we close. Isaiah's floored incomprehensible God, ah, my interpretation, <laughs> I'm out of luck to get my casket right now, I'm dead, woe is me. And an angel of the Lord comes and takes heaping burning coal, rubs it on his tongue, his sins are forgiven. And what is his natural response? The same as that, I hope, will come out of AMI tonight. You don't go on a one-year mission trip because someone asked you, You don't do it because you have three weeks of the summer to give something up. 
You don't get resent to China and stint just because of, you know what, maybe I ought to do something noble with my life, but in view of his mercy, offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. It is your most logical expression of worship. Live for the mission of God. You know, when I said uh, during worship, um, I need to hear your voice because you lifted me up. You know, when I preach up here, I don't care if I have a title. I really don't. I could be a janitor. Nothing wrong with that. I just want my life to count for Christ. If nobody knows of a church in Midtown Atlanta, but the gospel is going forward. He gets the glory. We trivialize the great and we glorify the good. I think this text serves as an urgent warning and wake-up call not to get caught up in religious activity like the Hebrews. But do you mean and do you own your life for Christ? Some of you are hanging on to sins. Some of you are pitting yourself. Lay your hand on his head tonight. Transfer, identify your wounds, your fears, your habitual sins. When you lay your hand on his head through faith, it's, it's a pleasing aroma. I'm no more holy than anybody else, but I know my God died for me. And I just want to live for this mission. I wish many times I could go and join my friend Paul in Southeast Asia. You know what, like, man, you know, I just, this, this, this. And, you know, God tells me to stay and I'll do whatever I can. And we want to see people be mobilized, not just for a summer, but for a lifetime and a call, not just building up A&I, but the kingdom of God, the universal God's church. Go on the basis of the burnt offering because of his holiness, longing to see reconciliation and more costly voluntary worship, corporate, personal, voluntary, involuntary, erupt and magnify him who is worthy. Surely our lives are more than just raising our hand, saying a token sinner's prayer, going to family group, going to Sunday, clapping our hands, singing, that's all great, but all of that is meant to build up the body of Christ so that more churches and more Christians would be produced. Amen? Amen. So excited. I'm 2002, graduated from seminary in May. Pastor Young pulls me aside, and my first Friday in May after I graduated, he tells me, about three days before that Friday. I don't know if he remembers, but I'm just so thankful to be out of seminary. And he tells me, Matt, you're preaching this Friday. I still remember, Ecclesiastes 12. And everything culminates in fearing God and obeying his commandments. And, and then I remember first staff meeting. So excited to be there. And he says, uh, Matt, uh, yeah, we're, taking, we're going to Peru and uh, yeah, you got to go. <laughs> I was petrified. Oh, I don't care. You know, there's another pastor there. I'll just shadow him. And we went on this trip, and we went to the mountains of Cusco. And we were told that there's this village two, three hours into the middle of nowhere that, that was unreached and needed to hear the gospel. And this missionary had been trying to build a relationship, but now that he had a team, he said, hey, why don't we go? And so we're excited, right? We're thinking, pioneer mission, right? No one has gone. Unreached people group. We're patting ourselves on the back. We're like writing in our journals. We've got a story to tell. Unreached people group, right? We get lost in the Inca Mountains. It starts to snow. We're stumbling around. We're on the side of a cliff. One particular time, right? It was so dark, right? We were on the side of this cliff, and all of a sudden, right, some rocks dislodge, and I realized, like, we were this close. Another particular, I'm not exaggerating, right? You can ask uh, if Hesuk's around, right? You can ask Hesuk, right? We, we were there, and, and all of a sudden, there's this heavy breathing on our backs. We turn around, and it's a llama. 
I, I hope Hesuk's not here, but she's freaking out. <laughs> she's screaming, and, and we're like, what in the world is all of this? And I'm not exact. I thought we would die. So we end up at the village, and, you know, we just spend about an hour there and do our gospel presentation, our, you know, our uh, mime skits and, you know, our body worship and, you know, all that. And, <laughs> and we get lost going home, and the whole time I'm thinking, Pastor Young's going to fire me. <laughs> the team's going to die on the field. <laughs> And by the grace of God, somehow we get home, and we go to our hotel. Everyone's wet from the snow, and everyone's tired, and everyone's aching because we carried all our equipment out in the middle of nowhere. And one guy, one guy just during debriefing, sharing, just says, hey, guys, we did something great. We took the gospel to an unreached people group. God needed us today. And I got so furious. And later on, I just pulled them aside and I basically said, no, God did not need us. God used us. But Acts 17 tells us about the self-sufficiency of God. He does not need human hands. The privilege of giving our life as disciples and doing the mission of God, God does not need us. God desires us to join him in what he's doing. And through that, even though we have adversity of circumstances and we're in Roman house prison cells, the joy surpasses the pain. A.W. Tozer, and we'll close. In one of his books and chapters regarding the self-sufficiency of God, Almighty God, just because he is almighty, needs no support. The picture of a nervous, ingratiating God fawning over men to win their favor is not a pleasant one. Yet if we look at the popular conception of God, that is precisely what we see. 20th century, I guess now it's the 21st, Christianity has put God on charity. So lofty is our opinion of ourselves that we find it quite easy not to say enjoyable, to believe that we're necessary to God. But the truth is that God is not greater for our being, nor would he be less if we did not exist. That we do exist is altogether of God's free determination, not by our desert nor by divine necessity. Probably the hardest thought of all for our natural egotism to entertain is that God does not need our help. We commonly represent him as a busy, eager, somewhat frustrated father hurrying about seeking help to carry out his benevolent plan to bring peace and salvation to the world. And Tozer concludes by saying, too many missionary appeals are based upon this fancied frustration of Almighty God. An effective speaker can easily excite people and pity in his hearers, not only for the heathen, but for the God who's so tired and so long to save them, and has failed for want of support. I fear that thousands of young persons enter Christian service from no higher motive than to deliver, help deliver God from an embarrassing situation. His love has gotten him into, and his limited abilities seem unable to get him out of. Add to this a certain degree of commendable idealism and a fair amount of compassion for the underprivileged social justice, and you have the true drive behind much Christian activity today. I don't want to close. Yeah, Leviticus 1 is done. But in light of the holiness of God and the animal vicariously being placed on the wooden beam of Calvary and Jesus fulfilling everything that he said from Genesis to Revelation and as he wants to set you free tonight and to give you kingdom vision, and to heal you of pains and forgive you of sins. We come to a point of God is self-sufficient. He doesn't need us, but the joy is ours because what? He loves us. He's the only God I know who can perfectly hate and love. But once we're covered by the blood of Jesus, the hatred is removed. And he is so in love with his people. I, too, 
not reducing it simply, and I know this is not what he meant, but I too love college students, young adults, old adults, children, kids still in their womb. The heartbeat of AMI is that we would see a mass mobilization of kingdom workers who see the harvest not because of great churches, not because of need and programs, but people who in a costly, voluntary way caught up in that Isaiah 6 beatific vision. They see the theophany and they say, here am I, send me. No questions asked. History tradition tells us that Isaiah was probably in prison and sawn in Do you think he cared? I would propose because of that original vision of God that was sustained throughout his lifetime. I wonder what will happen in a few moments when we go to the throne, when we lay down our cow, our bull, the lamb, Will you choose to touch the head of Christ in faith and transfer all the pain and all the fear? Will you choose to see this vicarious son of God, male unblemished, who took our place in the fulfillment of all scripture as the manifestation of God's perfect, holy, redeeming love? And may all of your life be lived in a response to that. Let's pray.